Doctor Who isn't just the longest running sci-fi series of all time, it's also one of the most iconic. But just what makes the Doctor tick? From monsters to madmen to Moffat fan theories, here's the untold truth of Doctor Who. One reason Doctor Who has managed to last so long is the fact that it's not beholden to one particular star. Early on in the show's history, the producers built in a process to change the main actor and have it fit right in with the narrative. Regeneration. By regenerating, the Doctor can change to a new actor with a different personality, though he typically retains most of his or her memories. This whole idea came about because by 1966, 58-year-old star William Hartnell was ready to leave Doctor Who. Not only was his health on the downturn, but he didn't care for how the show's style was evolving under the guidance of newly appointed producer Innes Lloyd and story editor Jerry Davis. But how to continue Doctor Who if the lead actor walked out? By killing him off. Kinda. The show's creative staff came up with an idea. Whenever the centuries-old Doctor grew exhausted and weak, he could regenerate and take on a new form, in a new body provided by a new actor, of course. That ability to freely recast its main character has helped the show stay alive for decades. This concept gives enough wiggle room to recast the role as needed, and though it's certainly a risky move on the surface, it's been a key part of the show's longevity. So how'd they come up with the idea? Well, by tripping on acid, of course. According to an internal memo from the show's original creative team, regeneration was supposed to be a horrifying experience where the Doctor relives some of the most unendurable moments of his long life. The Doctor is forced to face everything he's done in the moment of regeneration. The producers say it's as if he's had the LSD drug, and instead of experiencing the kicks, he has the hell and dank horror, which can be its effect. Since 1963, the appearance of the Doctor has changed repeatedly, and the show itself has evolved on a number of occasions. Arguably, the only true constant in Doctor Who is the TARDIS. Short for time and relative dimension in space, the Doctor uses the bigger on the inside spaceship to whisk companions around space and time. Is it bigger? Uh, yes. Yeah. On the inside. But we need to concentrate. There it is. Yeah, I know where you're going with this, but I need you to calm down. On the outside? Oh, you certainly grasp the essentials. Why? It looks like a blue police call box because, as a time-traveling alien, the Doctor needs to be able to blend in while on Earth. Originally, the show's writers intended for the TARDIS to have a different form each adventure, blending into whatever landscape or setting the Doctor found himself in. Unfortunately, the show's meager budget precluded the crew from changing the the TARDIS every week, and since they already had the blue police box, they stuck with that. Naturally, this problem came with its own in-universe solution. In the show itself, the TARDIS is outfitted with a camouflaging chameleon circuit, one that happens to be perpetually broken. The show has also hinted on a number of occasions that the Doctor could get it fixed if he wanted to, but that he's actually kind of fond of the whole blue box look. In 1963, Verity Lambert was hired as the first producer for Doctor Who, making her the first ever female producer at the BBC. Lambert was in charge of the first two series of Doctor Who and left the project in 1965, but her legacy lives on. After her start on Doctor Who, Verity started her own television company and worked on several shows over the ensuing decades. Upon her passing in 2007, former Doctor Who showrunner Russell T Davies said, There are a hundred people in car working on Doctor Who and millions of viewers, in particular many children who love the program that Verity helped create. Her story, along with the saga that launched Doctor Who, was also chronicled in the TV movie An Adventure in Space and Time. Each time a new actor comes into play, a new version of the Doctor, they get a new sartorial look. Christopher Eccleston's iteration wore a black leather jacket, while Matt Smith's Doctor rocked a bow tie and occasionally a fez. The most famous Who costume accessory, however, is undoubtedly the overlong, multicolored scarf worn by the popular Fourth Doctor, played by Tom Baker. When putting together this particular look for the first time, costume designer James Aitchison went to a fabric shop, bought several 
several skeins of yarn and handed them off to Begonia Pope, the mother of a friend. He later explained, so I went to Begonia and I said, look, start knitting. He returned in a week's time to find that Pope had knitted a scarf that was 22 feet long. Pope had misunderstood the assignment and thought Aitchison wanted her to not just use a little of every color, but use up every last bit of yarn. Aitchison added, I think we shortened it a little bit though. Product placement isn't a modern day phenomenon. In fact, shows and consumer goods companies have been working together for decades. Case in point, fourth doctor, Tom Baker's stint as a salesman for Prime Computers in the 1980s. Baker starred in a hilariously cheesy series of commercials hawking the computer brand in which he had to use Prime Computers to save the world. The company was moderately popular in the 1980s and peaked sometime around 1988. Unfortunately, the company went defunct during the following decade, but luckily the commercials still exist. Because who'd want to miss this? Unlike other TV science fiction stalwarts, Doctor Who has never expanded its universe with a big screen movie. Two Who-related films were released in the 1960s, but they are extremely different from the TV series, to say the least. Seeking to capitalize on the merchandise spawning popularity of Doctor Who's most recognizable villains, the Daleks, Amicus Productions bought the movie rights to three Dalek-based Doctor Who adventures from the BBC and their creator, Who writer Terry Nation. Doctor Who and the Daleks and Daleks Invasion Earth 2150 AD are not an extension of the main Doctor Who canon. In the films, the Doctor isn't a Time Lord from another planet who travels around in the TARDIS, but rather a human Doctor whose last name is Who, played by horror legend Peter Cushing. Boasting full colour when the television Doctor Who was still airing in black and white, the first film was a hit, but the second one bombed, leading Amicus to cancel plans for a third Dalek movie. <laughs> Oh well. Thanks to the concept of regeneration, plenty of different actors have taken up the Doctor's mantle, and some potential stars could have taken the franchise in very different directions. According to the Times, Michael Jackson and Bill Cosby were at the top of the list to play the Doctor in a 1988 film adaption that never materialized. These might seem like some out-the-box choices for the role, but remember, this was the late 1980s. Jackson was trying to branch into film with efforts like Captain EO and Moonwalker, while Cosby was in the midst of the Cosby Show's success. Fans waited years for a female or black take on the iconic character, but it's amazing to think the show could have embraced that diversity far earlier than it ultimately did. Though he softened his stance on Doctor Who as of late, Christopher Eccleston famously disliked the show following his one-year stint as the Doctor when it relaunched in 2005 after a 16-year break. The actor told the Daily Record he'd had enough with the show, and once he realized he and the showrunners were never going to compromise over the creative direction of the series, he decided to leave, leading to the first regeneration of the modern era. Despite his quick exit, Eccleston still deserves a lot of credit for successfully relaunching the show. The actor was actually invited back to the 50th anniversary special, but negotiations broke down before a deal could be made. Eggleston's role was eventually reworked to introduce John Hurt's War Doctor. Introduced in the 2007 episode Blink, the terrifying weeping angels are essentially statues, only ones that can move at terrifying speeds, so long as nobody's looking at them. Created by writer Stephen Moffat, these unsettling creatures are actually based on a real-life experience. While on vacation in the coastal English county of Dorset, Moffat walked past a graveyard and decided to have a look around. Inside, he found a statue of a weeping angel. But here's where it gets weird. Years later, Moffat returned to the graveyard, but the angel was nowhere to be seen. Moffat explained to the Oxford Union, there are two possible explanations. One is that the weeping angels are real. The other is that I somehow made up the weeping angel and it was never there. He even did some research into the graveyard and found no evidence that there was ever a weeping angel statue there. 
It's crazy to think, but Doctor Who has actually been around long enough that kids who watched the series growing up are now old enough to actually be writing and producing the series. And that's exactly what happened for ex-showrunner Stephen Moffat. In 1995, when he was still just a fan, Moffat posited a fan theory in a Doctor Who chat room. His idea was that the universe developed the word Doctor to describe a healer or peacemaker, based on the legend of the Doctor's travels throughout time and space. Moffat admitted his theory was stupid, but said he was rather proud of it anyway. Fast forward 16 years and Moffat is running Doctor Who. In the 2011 episode, A Good Man Goes to War, Alex Kingston's River Song gives a speech to the Doctor that pretty much turns Moffat's fan theory into canon. Doctor, the word for healer and wise man throughout the universe. We get that word from you, you know. Much the same way showrunner Stephen Moffat relished the chance to make his fan theory canon, Doctor Who star Peter Capaldi was also living out a childhood dream during his time on the show. Capaldi was a hardcore Doctor Who fan as a teenager and has made no secret about the fact that the show is what inspired him to get into show business. Rather famously, Capaldi was so obsessed with Doctor Who that he constantly bombarded the show's creative team with fan mail, to the point that one of them once openly wished the Dalek would exterminate him. Keith Miller, who ran the Doctor Who fan club at the time, wrote in his book, He haunted my time running the fan club. He was quite indignant he wasn't considered for the post, and the show's production secretary, Sarah Newman, couldn't stand him. After the departure of Peter Capaldi in 2017, Jodie Whittaker made history, becoming not only the 13th actor to portray the Doctor in an official capacity, but also the first woman. The regeneration coincided with a switch in backstage talent too, as longtime showrunner Stephen Moffat left the series in the hands of Chris Chibnall. For Chibnall, casting a woman in the role was never a question of should, but one of who. According to the BBC, Chibnall selected Whittaker after months of lists, conversations, auditions and recalls, but he always knew that his doctor would be a woman. But the road to Whittaker was a long one. In 1986, BBC head of drama Sidney Newman told producers that the next doctor ought to be a female. While Britcom stars Dawn French and Joanna Lumley were briefly considered, Newman's suggestion was overruled. In the end, Sylvester McCoy became doctor number seven. Oscar winner Dame Judi Dench was later considered to star in the show's mid-2000s reboot, ultimately losing out to Christopher Eccleston. Check out one of our newest videos right here, plus even more Looper videos about your favorite shows are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.